The Columbus Metropolitan Club was founded in 1976 by 13 women leaders who wanted to be included in the community conversation. I am Sally Bloomfield and I was one of those 13 women. Having been left out of men's clubs that focused on community issues, it was a priority for us to make the club 100% inclusive. Today, CMC presents public policy forums every Wednesday at lunch with average attendance of more than 200 people. I'm Tony Bell and I frequently attend forums which are open to everyone and present relevant, current and newsworthy topics. I'm grateful that CMC is nonpartisan and presents many perspectives on every topic. I'm Jane Scott, President and CEO of the Columbus Metropolitan Club. CMC is open to everyone. We invite you to explore the personal and professional benefits awaiting you at the Metropolitan Club. Welcome to CMC. Welcome to CMC. Welcome to CMC. Welcome to CMC. All right, good afternoon. Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. We're so happy you're here today on this cool January day. Founded in 1976 by 13 visionary women leaders, CMC's mission is to connect people and ideas through community conversation. From its beginning, CMC has welcomed everyone. I'm Carrie Schmidt, managing partner with Plentiful and member of CMC's board of trustees. Let's begin by meeting our newest CMC members, Emily Preto, and from JPS Print, Alpha Tongor, Zari Carmona Tongar, and Stephen Murphy. Welcome to CMC. <laughs> we invite you to become a CMC member and your organization to become a CMC sponsor. On the back of your forum flyers are the organizations that provide the not-for-profit Columbus Metropolitan Club with half of its annual revenue. To join this list of generous sponsors, please see Lainey Cuthbert in the back with CMC. Today's forum is sponsored by CareSource and Grange Insurance. Today's live stream is presented by the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch. Thanks, let's thank, oops, excuse me, let's thank all of those supporting today's forum. So now to the, to the forum. Columbus is home to nonprofits and social enterprises that embody a laser-focused approach to solving social challenges with initiatives that, produ that produce results that are backed by data. When working to solve social, social issues, the pitfalls to well-meaning organizations can be many, including mission creep and the temptation to analyze results through rose-colored lenses. For organizations that manage to stay laser focused and that bluntly self-assess their impact, genuine social change, even at a global scale, is possible. Today we'll explore the determination needed to drive that social change and the lessons learned by Central Ohio experts whose efforts are making Columbus and the world a better place. Let's please welcome today's speakers, Ann Bishop, the CEO of Starhouse, Greg Bixler, the co-founder and CEO of Design Outreach. <laughs> Vicki Bowen Hughes, CEO of Social Ventures. <laughs> and our host, Laura Smith, Vice President of Programs and Learning with Philanthropy Ohio. You can learn. <laughs> Jumped out there, sorry. You can learn more about our speakers in today's forum flyer. And Laura, we look forward to today's conversation. Good afternoon. Uh, Deborah sends her regrets and is really sorry that she was unwell today and was not able to be here. Um, but I am really pleased to be alongside you today and really alongside this wonderful panel. So let's get started. You know, creativity, 
focus, determination. You know, these are just some of the elements that our panelists embody themselves and indeed embed in the work of their organizations. Values-driven, inclusive, compassionate, entrepreneurial. These elements are necessary to drive meaningful social change and are demonstrated by the work they are each doing within their organizations to deliver on sustainable nonprofit and social enterprise models. Empowering others, systems focused, fostering well-being through connection. These approaches are what stood out to me as I got to know more about their work and know that you will get to learn more about their laser-focused missions, hear examples about the meaningful social change they are making, about the discipline and their strategies, and about the power of connections to propel their impact. So I'd like to jump right into the conversation. So Anne, can you tell us about the mission of Star House and the social impact the organization is making? Sure, good afternoon everybody. I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces out there. Some of you I haven't seen since before the pandemic. It feels a bit like a family reunion, so just wanted to say hello everyone. Uh, Star House's mission is to do whatever it takes to lift young people experiencing homelessness out of homelessness and to put them on a tra trajectory towards stability, surefire stability. And we define that stability as having all four essentials of stability, the things that all of us need to sustain our housing, whether we realize it or not. And that's truly affordable housing, a good paying job with the education you need to get and keep that housing, health and well-being, and what we consider to be the most important piece, and that is community, true community and supportive relationships. The fact is, though, that in Central Ohio, in Franklin County, in a year's time, there are 3,000 individual youth estimated to experience homelessness, and we're talking about 14 to 24-year-olds. Their experience, the common denominator, is disconnection from family. Half were in foster care, a quarter to 40%, depending on when and where you survey, identify as LGBTQ, and they tell us they've been kicked out after coming out. The same thing goes for pregnant teens and young adults, and still others have run away from abuse in the home. And because they've been let down by the adults in their lives, they are suffering from complex trauma, and as expected, extreme distrust for older adults and uh, systems. And so our model is, is designed to create a, a place where they feel safe to be re-engaged and to embark on that journey toward their healing and eventual stability. Our drop-in center is a place where they can have immediate access to safety. Once in our doors, they can prepare their own meal in our kitchen. They don't have to wait for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. They can grab a change of clothes, wash their clothes, get a shower, and rest. And then the next step is, again, the most important piece, and that's relationships, building trusting relationships with our team. And that's really the game changer and what sets them on the trajectory towards surefire stability. Thanks so much, Ann. I want to move now to Greg. You know, design outreach has a philosophy of thinking outside the box. And you've said that you work towards not settling for less when that's what's expected. Can you share with us how, as a social enterprise, that philosophy guides your work? Yeah, absolutely, and thank you uh, for letting us to be here today and share and, and for moderating. As Design Outreach, we're a, a nonprofit that works to create sustainable technology solutions that are appropriate for people in developing countries. And what we find in our space in international community development, we often find that, that the bar is set too low. It's, it's the status quo, what everybody's used to doing, and oftentimes it needs to be set higher. And the bar is usually set based on what other organizations think they can raise money to do versus what the right thing is to do. So we, we look at it as, as a systems problem of, of training, of funding, and of, in many cases, appropriate technology. But when the technology doesn't exist, somebody has to create that technology. And, and if there's any engineers out there, technologists, you'll know uh, doing R&D work is very expensive. And so we created a model to, to do that work, to create those technologies but not just to create a technology, but plug it into a system that, that brings value. So instead of looking in short-term gains, like what is the cheapest way to alle alleviate a problem for the next year, we look at it in, in, in long-term and saying, what is, should it look like in the next five or 10 years? And what's the total cost of ownership versus um, what we think donors will pay for or what they have traditionally paid for? And, and we also are able to then sell those technologies to our partners who who agree in the value of what we're creating. 
So that's how we're able to help raise the bar and buck the system uh, through not only creating those technologies, but then advocating for their use. And this is increasing the standards. Thanks, Greg. And, and it seems like both of you are talking about elevating that bar, um, both for ourselves and for what we expect from others. And I want to move now to Vicki. Um, social Ventures Laser Focus is on developing and advocating for businesses driving social change and driving profit. Can you share with us how you help social enterprises scale and to increase impact and, of course, the importance of peer networks to your work? Sure. Um, first, I want to say thank you so much for the opportunity to share about social enterprise. I'm not sure that, I think that if we asked everybody in this room what is social enterprise, everybody might have a different definition of what social enterprise is. Um, my definition and social ventures definition is that it's a business that's founded on affecting social change and also has a market-driven approach. So there is an independent revenue stream that can be a for-profit or a non-profit business. So a couple of great examples, both Anne and Greg lead nonprofit organizations. Um, an organization that you might know here in town, Hot Chicken Takeover, is a for-profit social enterprise. So that kind of nebulous, bringing that kind of nebulous um, idea into business doing good is what we want to, Social Ventures wants to be able to advance in our community. We advocate for support and help fund organizations that are advancing solutions to social problems in our community. And we do that in, in myriad ways. Um, one thing that we've recently done is we really honed in on who our customer is. And our customer is the social enterprise that is post-launch. They are earning revenue, and they've hit that leadership desert. Like, I'm here, I'm doing good things, uh, and I need help to get to next. So we have um, three different pillars that we work within. Uh, that's advise, connect, and promote. And what we want to do is help those so social entrepreneurs make sure that they have the resources they need to scale impact, that they have the connections to do that, and also that the community is aware, businesses are aware and individuals are aware from a consumer perspective that through their purchases, they can also help solve problems in the community. Yeah, th thank you so much. So I really want to think about that, about that a little bit more. So you're each striving toward that meaningful social change. Can you illustrate that for us? Kind of give us an example of what that looks like in your work to see that meaningful social change. And Anne, do you, would you like to start? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to start. Um, some of you in this room know that Star House began way back in 2006 as a research study of The Ohio State University. And the study was designed to uncover street living youth in our community and figure out new strategies for re-engaging them and connecting them with stabilizing resources. Uh, you know, the, that study culminated in the drop-in center that we have now, this evidence-based model that engages youth, finds them, re-engages them, and connects them. And what we've learned is, you know, the research has continued both in partnership with OSU and uh, at Star House as an independent organization now. Uh, what we know is that after being at the drop-in center for 90 or more days, 70 to 75 percent of our young people obtain housing. And this is certainly remarkable. We celebrate this, but we're not satisfied because far too often these young people are becoming homeless again, and sometimes again and again. And so with, for this population that's been let down, that's disconnected, we have to create housing strategies that are uh, create both a safety net and a launch pad towards stability. Pew Research, I'm sure many of you saw the study, put out a study uh, during the pandemic that said that 52% of all young adults ages 30 and under are living at home with their parents. Some of you in this room might be experiencing this firsthand. Uh, but there, this is the highest level since the Great Depression. And we're talking about young people ages 14 to 24 who are living alone in this world, homeless, who don't have that option. There's no mom's basement. 
There's no dad's pocketbook to fill in gaps. They're alone in this world. And so our strategies have to go deeper and really focus on uh, connecting youth with sure fire stability. So Carol Stewart Village is our attempt at creating a, a new strategy, new solutions to address this population of young people. Carol Stewart Village is a joint ownership collaboration of finance funds, the Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority and Star House. We each, as part of our ownership deal, uh, have a very specific role in operating Carroll Stewart Village. Finance Fund is the housing developer. The Housing Authority provides vouchers that enable young people who live at Carroll Stewart Village to have, if they move in at 18, up to seven years of housing where they can get all the building blocks of stability in place and, and on one site. And then Star House, we stay laser focused in our lane, which is ensuring that we have social services on site that are going to create that foundation for them to have long-term stability. Uh, we took an old Motel 6 and converted 62 old motels into studio apartments. We have on-site jobs, transitional jobs through social enterprise partners, on-site healthcare through partners, uh, therapy, healthcare, all the resources they need, even community engagement opportunities where they can begin to dig roots in the community around them through mentoring and other things is based, baked into uh, this program. We're seeing promising outcomes. We've been open since August of 2020. And one thing that we're most proud of is that there have been zero formal evictions with this population. Now, have we had to help young people find a better living situation? Yes, but because the property management team and Star House has been very laser focused on doing whatever it takes to prevent evictions, we have zero form formal evictions. Uh, I'll give an example. You know, we've had some young people at Star House, at uh, Carroll Stewart Village who, because they were stabilized there, they've been reunited with their children. And so, uh, you know, it's not really conducive to raise a family inside of a small studio apartment. So we've been able to find them uh, longer term housing elsewhere. So we're, we're very excited to potentially repl replicate this program in other neighborhoods in our community. Thank you so much, Anne. Greg, Vicki, um, I would like to move to you to hear how you would illustrate social change through your work. Sure, absolutely. Um, so one of the one of the ways that I'm really excited about advancing social change with social ventures is bringing more diversity, equity, and inclusion into the social enterprise ecosystem. And we're leading that um, by really reaching out to the community and. Um, checking in to see where we can include more businesses that are driving change that are in communities that are underrepresented. So something that we're launching um, in March, I almost said next month because the year goes by so quick, um, but we're launching in March is Women Sparking Change, where we are really embracing and uplifting and amplifying the voices of women of color who are also social entrepreneurs we work with over 120 social enterprises. Of that, 56% are led by women, woo! And uh, of that, 33% are culturally diverse. So having that as our launch pad and our platform to reach out to the community and say, we want to advance social change by lifting and amplifying is something that we're really enthusiastic about. Yeah, and we've <clears throat> we've seen some some pretty amazing social change and, and communities being transformed. So we work in 11 countries now, and in about 200 communities. And this all started about 12 years ago when we first learned about this problem of water pumps that go into communities that are a common way of getting water in in communities that are living in extreme poverty. We're talking we're talking about dirt floor grass roof communities. And in 2022, there's still a billion people who don't have access to safe water a billion people and that's we, we see that as as a choice why is that you know looking around what we have here in this room in this city we can we can make a change and so one of the communities i, I love highlighting is our very first community this is uh, in a community called uh, zalamondo in the country of malawi where the work all started for us we started working with world vision in that country about eight years ago and we created what we call the life pump, which is a technology that goes much deeper than other hand pumps, but it also lasts much longer. So it can go for years between maintenance cycles, whereas typical hand pumps are designed in such a way where they are limited in depth, 
And also, they usually need repairs after about six months, maybe in some cases three months. And what happens is those repairs usually don't get done very quickly, if ever. So these communities go through these cycles of poverty. They call it water poverty. And you may have water for a while. It's convenient. It's nice. The water pump breaks. Your garden dies. You take your few animals to the slaughterhouse sooner than you expected. Your kids get pulled out of school. They go back to rivers where there's crocodiles. I've been to these places, and I've seen this. In the, in the community of Zalamondo, they've now had a life pump for over eight years, and there's never been a single day without water. That's unheard of. And we have a technology called Life Pump Link, which can track that and tell us how much the pump's being used and when. So we get daily information from these very remote rural areas in developing countries telling us that what we're doing is actually working. And then we get to go back and see it firsthand with our own eyes. You see animals, you see gardens, you see kids in school, you see teachers who are willing to accept jobs at the schools, not because there's kids that need education, but because they also have water now that the teachers can use. That's transformation, and it's just mind-boggling to think that it's not just a matter of, of giving water to a community or a water pump. It's a matter of giving them hope that the water will be there tomorrow, and that's, that's really the transformation that we've seen. And I'm hearing something that's common for each of you, and I wanted to call out something that you said, Anne, that we want to celebrate it, but we're not satisfied. And I think for any of us who've done any of the work in diversity, equity, inclusion, um, we do a lot of this at Through Philanthropy Ohio. Um, that's really, that's the case as well. And Vicki, you sort of spoke to that, and so did you, Greg, when you talked about the one billion people still don't have water. So let's celebrate these moments, but don't lose sight of the fact that we can't be satisfied. We can't become complacent. We still must drive toward that laser focus. So thank you for each of you for illustrating that. And I just wanna move now to thinking about from vision to mission to business. So the business of running a nonprofit or a social enterprise really isn't any less rigorous than running a business um, that's for profit. In fact, you know, you could argue that it requires a disciplined decision making to stay focused on mission. Can you share an example of when using such discipline made a difference or when you had to make a hard decision that ended up being the right choice? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in here. In the last year, we were given an opportunity to take a six to seven figure donation, uh, donation or grant rather to administer a program for our youth that would have been well and good for our youth. But it wasn't in alignment with our long-term vision and our strategic plan. So we made the very difficult decision to uh, turn those that those funds down now our youth are still benefiting we're able to refer our youth to another organization that's administering uh, that resource but it was one of the best decisions we've ever made because it has enabled us to stay laser focused on our big vision one tool that we use to ensure that we're focused is the entrepreneurial operating system uh, EOS I'm sure many of you have read Gina Wickman's book traction which outlines this system it's simple very, very simple. It's uh, designed for mission-oriented oriented organizations that want to stay laser-focused on their mission and their vision and what it's going to take to get there. You set a 10-year vision. Typically, we set a 20-year vision so as not to terrify our board. <laughs> our 20-year vision is to expand our program based on the demand for our model throughout the nation and globally. And from there, you create a three-year picture where you think you need to be in the next three years. For us, we're, we're going to develop two drop-in centers in other neighborhoods in the next three years. And then you have your one-year plan locked in and your quarterly rocks, which are goals, eight goals that are set in stone that you're not going to, to change from one quarter to the next. And this has enabled our entire organization from the frontline team to our board to stay laser focused on, this, on what we're trying to do here. And I'll tell you, before we adopted EOS, the weight of the vision was on our shoulders. We knew what we needed to do, we knew where we were going, but the weight was there. So EOS takes that weight and drops it into a system, a visual dashboard where anybody in the organization can drop in and see how you're doing on your metrics from week to week uh, so that you can maintain that laser focus. Highly recommend it. Uh, EOSWorldwide.com is the <laughs> website if you're interested. They're not paying me to say that. I'm just that. <laughs> <They're> not sponsoring. <laughs> not sponsoring. Yeah. Thank you for, for sharing that. And I think we'll actually be coming back to, to talk a little bit more about that here in a moment. Um, and I, I love that your board love, wanted to go at the 20-year vision instead of the 10-year. That was more attainable. That may not be everyone's experience. So um, thank you for sharing that. And so, Vicki, I want to go to you now about um, 
the question of decision making and those those hard moments. Um, Anne mentioned turning down funding. Is there something you'd like to share on this? Sure. I, I'm relatively new in my role. I'm just celebrating six months with Social Ventures, and in that, um, the social entrepreneurial ecosystem in Central Ohio really just started about a decade ago. And uh, the founder of the organization who I succeeded, Alan Proctor, was really um, influential in helping to create the footprint for social enterprise in Central Ohio and did a lot of different things from you know, helping ideate on businesses to helping them scale, to helping them partner on a larger level, 